excited to see this place. Yeah, it's been a while since you uh, kind of been down here, so it's uh, definitely changed quite a bit. When was I think it was when we were doing fall food plots, probably was the last Yeah, month. so I, I think it was probably late July, early August of last year is when you were last down here. And so I think you'd only own, what you, you owned it like for two months at that time? So I closed, yeah, I closed like right at the beginning of July of last year. So we're not even at one year ownership at this point in time. Yeah, almost coming up on one year. That's crazy. Already it looks so different. You know, I remember like one of the first times I came down to the property, there was a bunch of cedars and it was just kind of grown up with kind of brambles and different stuff, you know, down this lane. And that was kind of one of the very first projects where it was like I mowed a, you know, ATV trail essentially to get back to what's now the tillable acres and yeah. now to see what it looks like where it's kind of going to be the footprint of, you know, something else in the future too. Yeah. It's just crazy to see the transformation. I'm excited to see all of it. Obviously, you and I talk a lot, so I know some of the projects that happened, but I haven't seen them in person yet. Yeah, I'm excited to show you. And this is crazy. It looks so different. Yeah, it's wild how it just, in a few months, just looks completely different with having row crop out here too. It's just yeah. such an abrupt change. And, you know, I don't know that long term this will all be tillable, but it's just an abrupt change from what it looked like, you know, just a year ago. Yeah. That's amazing how much different it looks. I know you've been sending me like drone shots and stuff as it progressed, but it's uh, it's crazy to see it in person how much different it looks and just like what you can take a field like that right. like, overgrown cedars and just had been kind of sitting there doing nothing to a productive field like this. Yeah, it was definitely a diamond in the rough, that's for sure, because I think when I last had count, I think I had like 560 trees I pulled off of just this section right here, which, you know, most of them were pretty small in diameter, you know, six inches or smaller, but that's still a lot of trees that we pulled off of this property. Yeah. Well, as you guys can see, we're out here with Zach today, and uh, I figured it'd be kind of interesting, at least it is for me, to come visit this property. Some background information, Zach and I actually walked this piece when it was for sale talked even potentially about yeah. going in together on it I, ultimately I wasn't ready at the time to looking pull the back trigger. now we should have made that happen <laughs> yeah but so I got to see it in the very early stages and uh, Zach and I are a lot alike in in terms of loving the process of land management and improvement and just all that type of stuff you and I talk relatively often but it's almost always about something land yeah related it's always or, about land management or circling back to that somehow yeah so. so I'm really anxious to see everything Zach's done like we talked about it's been many months since I was last here you know we were planting fall plots out here is when the last time I've seen it and it's changed a lot so we're going to talk about some of the projects Zach has has completed and has ongoing uh, with this property um, like we talked about you bought it almost a year ago now yeah we're coming up on a year right at the beginning of uh, July last year is when we took possession of it yeah and so talk about kind of that or at least the things you thought about back then I mean we we talked about so many different properties we looked at different properties this was ultimately your first purchase with between you and your wife yeah um, talk about some of the things you were looking for and why you kind of settled on this piece yeah, so, uh, you know, my wife and I were, I'm fortunate that she shares my dream of land ownership, you know, and kind of have that being an investment side of it, but also something that brings us a lot of joy from like the recreational side of things, the land management side of things. Um, so over the past two years, I'd say we've been pretty aggressive on like trying to find that first property. And I think that with that being said too, we kind of knew the first property may not be like the forever property, you know, type of thing. You know, we all kind of hear about these stories about you know, kind of doing 1031 exchange, maybe into the next property, what it looks like. Um, but we had a lot that we kind of had, you know, that we were looking for. And I think that one of the biggest things was we wanted it to be relatively close to home. So this is, you know, pretty close to where I live. Um, I always wanted it to be within 45 minutes from home because I've had access to farms that are over an hour away from my house. And I, they've been really good farms, but they're so hard to get to. So that was one of my criteria. And I wanted it to be a blend of timber and tillable, whatever that looked like, you know, even if it was a 30 acre track, 20 acre track, whatever it was, I wanted there to be a blend, um, you know, whatever that looked like. And then last is that we wanted it to be a situation where it was a diamond in the rough, you know, a situation where I could put my sweat equity into it and it was gonna be 
a really good return on investment for us ultimately. Yeah, that's where I think you and I are a lot like. We wouldn't purchase a farm that was turnkey. Right. Like it, it, it takes a lot of the fun out of it. You can look at a piece of land in your mind, visualize how you can turn it into a, a better property, more return on investment, better hunting, all that type of stuff. And so your second point of <clears throat> having tillable or having some type of income on it, this didn't have that when you bought it. No. But you saw the potential of it. So talk us through, because this is probably the biggest visual change that, that I can see having seen it before and the after looking at this big soybean field uh, that was basically nothing before. Yeah, so the farm itself is 90 acres. Um, there's roughly 30 acres of quote unquote tillable ground on it. You know, not all that's being farmed is probably closer to 25 because there's some gullies and stuff. And there's some areas that I've sectioned off specifically for food plots type of thing too. But one of the things, you know, on this farm that really drew me to it, and I think that even you and I talked about this countless times about this specific property, is you don't find very many that haven't been farmed, they're not in any type of program, you know, it's not committed to like a CRP type program for 30 years, which you can kind of restrict what you can do with the property a little bit too. This wasn't in any programs whatsoever, and it was just a blank slate, you know, and that's what kept drawing me to it, you know, because originally this was a lot larger tract than what we purchased, and you know, the, the real estate company that originally had it, they weren't willing to section areas off, so, but I kept coming back to it, kept coming back to it, and it was just one of those situations where I just knew that if I was willing to put in the sweat equity that it could turn into kind of what it is today where it's generating me income, it's a food plot for me. And I also think my return on investment just from a property standpoint is really good right now because now I have roughly 30 acres, you know, that's back into income, you know, potential, you know, type of thing where before essentially it was pasture ground that hadn't been farmed in over 25 years. Yeah. So what is your long-term goal or maybe not long-term, maybe a few years, is your goal to enroll this in CRP? At least it's obviously gonna be eligible. Would that be your goal or do you like having the row crop? You know, I, I like, I think that there's gonna be a blend of it, you know, type of thing too. Um, I don't know that, I think that one of the things with land management, your plan's always kind of changing over time, you know, type of thing. But I would like to do some tree planning, definitely have a blend of row crop on it for sure. But um, I always think diversity when I'm trying to think of this land management stuff where I wanna interject you know, some type of warm season grasses, maybe some pollinator mixes, you know, to, to just get some, you know, different types of diversity on this property from, you know, whether it's the food component year round, so I'm holding the deer or holding the wildlife, providing for turkeys, whatever it is, just diversifying a little bit more because the one negative about having 30 acres of tillable is it's a monoculture. So it's all one thing, you know, type of thing. And if I can interject, you know, some different food sources, maybe some a green food source or something along those lines, some tree product, and maybe some thermal cover with warm season grasses. You know, those are things I'm going to evaluate, but there's definitely going to be a component of agriculture on this, you know, for perpetuity in my idea with the property. Yeah, the d diversity is awesome, but also like this property I think is a really good example of being able to balance the income, and obviously the tillable, but also the habitat, the conservation aspect. Right. So like even like the tillable acres as they sit right now, this was kind of part of the big plan where we, in the grand scheme of things where you think that now we had a blank slate before, but now even more we have a blank slate, you know, because if I want to do some of those interjection of trees or, you know, whether it's warm season grasses, whatever it might be, you know, going into a soybean stubble is great for doing any of that, you know, type of thing for, you know, future management, whatever that looks like. But at this point in time, we're kind of in the process of kind of getting some of that weed control under control. You know, I, I, what I did through our process is, you know, we rented it out to a farmer and I'm kind of utilizing him to kind of use his experience to kind of get a lot of that under control because I don't claim to be a farmer, you know, ultimately when it comes down to it, you small know. Scale I, yeah, maybe small scale. I, I enjoy it, you know, type of thing. Um, hobby farmer maybe, you know, at best. But uh, it's, I enjoy doing this type of stuff, but you know, utilizing his experience to get a lot of the weed control and the weed suppression under, you know, kind of under wraps, you know, was kind of the goal for these first couple of years. And then maybe we can consider doing some custom farming stuff and, or in something considering that in the future. And speaking of that and the conservation aspect, this was no-till and that was important to you. You talked about that. Yeah, so th the actual farmer that's um, doing um, all the agricultural stuff on this property, this is kind of a ways from home for him, you know, but it's somebody that I had a relationship with and I knew what type of farmer he was. You know, he was someone that was going to think, you know, big picture about soil conservation, you know, not having substantial runoff 
And you know, a lot of people would have saw this for like what it looked like before, where you know how you had five foot tall grass, you know, type of thing, and you would have in instantly thought, hey, you got to till the whole thing up and like you know make it essentially powder, you know, type of thing. And that's the only way you can do it. Where really all we did, you know, to get to this point where it's at, I did the tree removal, I did a burn, and then we did a burn down with herbicide, you know, and that's how we got to where we're at, and we went directly into that thatch, which. If you do think about it, I think it's going to benefit the farmer too from like if we do have a drier year, which we had rain today, but if we do have a drier growing season, that thatch is going to hold moisture and ideally his beans are going to do pretty well on it. Mm -hmm. Let's walk out in here a little bit and just kind of check out this field a little yeah, closer. Yeah, sure. Decent amount of deer tracks. Not too much browse pressure for being the end of a cove though. Right. I was thinking about moving it like right here and kind of still catch the edge of that where they've been scraping just a little bit. Yeah. Another great scrape tree just far enough away from the edge to stand out. Yeah. Well, this has been one of the most productive cameras on the farm, but I'm actually going to move it just out to this edge a little bit just because for whatever reason recently I haven't been getting a lot of photos and I think if I get a little bit more of that bean field, I might pick up a few more photos, you know, on a daily basis. Did you get a lot of bucks here last fall? Yeah. This is that spot where I picked up that buck that I call turkey, you know, quite a bit. And uh, I think he'll definitely be right at the top of the hit list this year. He's a really good deer, definitely bigger. You know, when we were looking at that shed when I found him, you know, that shed's only 75 yards from where we're standing. But, I mean, he's a bigger deer when I found that shed than what I thought he was. Um, and if he makes a jump this year, I mean, he's going to be right at the top of the hit list for sure. That yeah, shed is way bigger in person. Do you think he was cored up? pretty close to here mostly most of the fall so I think that he probably cores up on this farm unit you know type of deal where he's on my neighbors quite a bit too um, I've been fortunate that I've kind of worked a relationship with my neighbors specifically to the north too but we've been sharing a lot of photos working with each other you know working with each other rather than against each other so that's been fun to kind of work through that process and I really think that what that deer is doing is that when he's coming onto my farm essentially he's making a big loop and then he's coming through theirs but I think he's spending a lot of time up north but there were definitely times specifically in late October, November, where he was on my farm a lot. Yeah, That's, that neighbor aspect is huge. I mean, it, it, it's not always the situation you can find. You know, sometimes it's just unfortunate you end up with bad neighbors or yep. a bad neighborhood or whatever it is. But if you can find that, I mean, I, I've always said your, your farm's only as good as your neighbor's right. farm in terms of like a, a management standpoint. You can have your goals, but if your neighbors aren't on the same page, your goals are kind of useless. Um, so that's awesome that you found that here or, you know, work towards that. I'm yeah. sure it wasn't and, easy. You kind of yeah, and it's all, and that's it. always a process, you know, because this is a little ways from home. So I had to like introduce myself to a lot of these people too and kind of yeah. knock on doors or if I saw a vehicle driving by, I'd flag them down and just kind of introduce myself too. Yeah. And that was actually one of those conversations led to, they did the dirt work for me on my lane, you know, type of thing and like did the clearing out of that lane and stuff like that because they had an excavating business. So it, it's always a process for doing that. And ultimately, in my experience, if you can work with them, they're gonna help you out too, because they're gonna be like, hey Zach, I noticed a vehicle here, or yeah. you know, is everything okay? Or you know, what's going on? Just kind of keeping eyes on it too. So that's, that's great. Yeah. Zach, where'd the name Turkey come from? Yeah, so uh, we like to do themes. So my wife typically helps, you know, with the naming of these deer when we're kind of developing that hit list or just familiar bucks, whatever they are. And uh, for this farm, we actually decided to go with food. Because um, I know some themes I've done in the past where you do sports or something like that or you know maybe your favorite sports team you kind of run out of names after a while especially if you have several years of history and so food it's like an endless supply so turkey and he has kind of like a weird like turkey you know tying on like the one side so that kind of fit we have another buck down here that we call mac and cheese you know he's like a regular he's a really old deer we had a buck we called noodle last year I mean so like just food's endless supply, so it's pretty easy to come up with different names. That's awesome. It's, <laughs> it's unique. I haven't heard that one before. <laughs> so, Here we are at the high hide. I remember this stand for sure. <clears throat> I think it took us like two hours to hang this stand that one day, so it's kind of hard to see right now. They're going to need to do a little trimming. but I know it's, it's funny because this is like that cottonwood, we picked it out early, early, yeah. and we're like, man, this would make up for a cool set. Yeah. And then a couple months later, we came and hung it. I think it was actually the day that we originally walked the farm. You know, when we came down here and walked it when it was for sale. Yeah. I remember we looked up at that tree and we thought, man, if you sat there, you could see all this CRP type, you know, prairie, you know, in front of you, you know, type of deal. And 
Turns out you can because <laughs> like when you sit up there, it's a pretty cool set and I call it the high hide and it's yeah. kind of a, it's not the most comfortable set because it's got a little lean to it, but it's, it's a good spot and I had some good encounters, you know, on this plot too with some deer. We had a good uh, Nolan film for me. We did, we had a good decoy hunt on this spot, you know, specifically where we had a buck come out of the timber and like all bristled up, you know, it was a really cool spot. Well, this is the third time I'm trying to do this interview. And uh, it's just been an awesome morning so far. We've seen a lot of deer activity. And uh, I don't know, I might be addicted to decoy hunting from here on out, because uh, I just can't wipe this smile off my face because that was just so cool to see that buck all bristled up. And you could literally watch his entire body just like pulsating. And I really thought he was gonna give it a go at the old decoy, so awesome hunt so far. All right, well, we're gonna finish this up right where we started off today at the front gate, and it's a new front gate for the property. And I've kind of referenced this as being the new front door where, you know, kind of talking about how this is the entrance way into the property, you know, type of thing, and kind of that return on investment where my idea for this property is, even if this isn't a forever farm, someone's gonna one day see this brand new gate that we put out here and kind of have it as the front door. Maybe that's the, gonna be the edge it is for someone to buy this property one day. Yeah, like the curb appeal. Like curb you, appeal, like you yeah. Put it. Yeah, for sure, I mean, it's, maybe something that gets overlooked at times and it's just a, a good visual thing to have nice entryway obviously keep people out too but yeah um well, we appreciate you having us out being able to walk around is it was truly awesome to see the transformation of it you've obviously put a lot of work into it over a short time period less than a year really yeah and I think, you know, there's a lot of sweat equity, you know, that's gone into this property. And it's something that I, I truly have a passion for. You know, we were just talking as we were walking our way out here that we both enjoy hunting, you know, just as much, if not more than anybody. But like the land management side of it is just something that has just gone to a whole nother level for me for just especially over the last four or five years. And I think that this property is a really good example of how it's attainable, you know, type of thing too. You know, my wife and I, we have a relatively modest income. You know, we've been able to, you know, save up for a period of time purchase this farm and then a lot of the work that I did even the tree removal you know I rented equipment you know I could have brought a contractor in here to do a lot of this work and when it cost tens of thousands of dollars you know for fifteen hundred dollars I rented a skid loader with a few attachments and I did all the work myself but regardless I love it you know the, the big kid Tonka toys getting out and playing with them you know type of thing that's something I really enjoy yeah I think that's I think you nailed it I think oftentimes it's perceived as this kind of rich man's game right yeah. but I'm truly a believer in almost anyone can do it you know if you and I can do it I feel like anybody can do it and not just the purchasing of the property but also all the work right I mean you have you found ways to to do it more or less on a budget you know me personally I I get access to big equipment because I work for a landowner right. there's for, always favors to do yeah, out there for sure for nothing and in turn he lets me borrow some of his equipment so there's there's ways to to do this type of stuff without you know, owning a bunch of equipment or uh, spending a bunch of money, uh, etc. I mean, if you're you're passionate enough about it, I'm, I'm believing you'll find a way to get it done. So, uh, again, thanks for having us out. It's yeah. it's pretty cool to see it and and to continue to watch it evolve. And most of you guys know Zach's on the Heartland Show, and you know you can follow his story there, follow the the story of the property, the story of the deer he's chasing all that type of stuff on the Heartland Regional Show. So appreciate the time again, Zach. Yeah, appreciate you guys coming down. Thanks.